The CBs, Naval Construction Battalions, are the youngest and most unique development in our naval organization. Yet, no branch of any of the services has a finer record of work accomplished. The CBs have participated in practically every amphibious operation undertaken in all theaters of war. Landing with the first waves of assault troops, getting equipment ashore, and setting up bases of operations, despite all the difficulties and hardships of war. In all the widespread theaters of this global war, no area has posed as many difficulties and hardships to our construction battalions as have the Aleutians, not from the standpoint of enemy operation, but from the continuous battle waged against the forces of nature. These natural forces give no respite, never retreat, and can never be vanquished. The best man can hope to do is to control them with an unceasing vigil. The picture you are about to see is the little known story of our northern road to Tokyo, a chain of islands extending from the Alaskan mainland toward our enemy Japan and our ally Russia, the Aleutian Islands. The Aleutians lie in the North Pacific, dividing that ocean from the Bering Sea. This island chain stretches 1,200 miles west-southwest from the Alaskan mainland, forming stepping stones out toward Japan and Russian Siberia. It is the key to North Pacific strategy. So when the Japanese struck at our western defenses in 1942, they struck at both Midway and Dutch Harbor, going all out to unhinge the vital line defending our western coast. American sea and air power crushed them at Midway and at Dutch Harbor too where we sank six warships and two transports. But the shattered Japanese force swung west and seized a foothold on Kiska, Atu, and Agatu. Our first job was to take the offensive and root them out. We started with only one island base, but we did throw them out. The islands are anything but ideal spots for living or fighting. They're of volcanic origin and some peaks are still active. Terrain is rough and rugged with sharply rising rocky shores. The soil is either volcanic ash or tundra. The climate is unpredictable, but usually bad. None of the comforts or necessities of life exist on the islands except fresh water. On each island, with every new phase of the job, everything we need must come in by ship and lighter, from a jeep to a can of beans, thumbtacks to pile drivers, all the gear and equipment, large and small, to build, live, and fight. We didn't start out here to create just a camp or two, but to convert the Aleutian wastes into a system of permanent advanced bases, a citadel of war. Rudely winterized tents provide shelter as we start our first airstrip, which, like many of the scores finally built, began as a tidal flat under several feet of water. Army and Navy engineers cut off the inlet and drained off the water. Then, earth-moving machinery, handled by men who understand it almost by instinct, finish the job. The guy who's grown up with his own jalopy has a natural sympathy for machines like these. With feverish work day and night, the gray volcanic dust is shifted, leveled, pounded, and compacted, ready for its final surface. No luxury of smooth concrete for flyers up here but a million and a half square feet of preformed steel matting, laid by hand. Too bad we don't have a machine for this job. But the original airstrip, from the start of work to the first American plane to land, consumed just 10 days and 11 nights of work. Just 10 days after the strip was started, the first daily missions went out to blast the Japanese on those western islands, two hours flight away, bomb them, harass them, wreck their supply ships start the hard job of driving them out of the Aleutian Islands. Our patrol, fighter, and bomber pilots learn to fly from a field that's constantly under six inches of water. But they flew every day, weather permitting. And Aleutian weather is, to say the least, undependable. 
There's a permanent low pressure area here, and when warm air masses from the south hit that, anything can happen. Blizzard, rain, sunshine, and fog, all in one day. And that fierce wind called the Willowar. These islands are truly the birthplace of storms. This weather, starting here, goes down over the whole North Pacific. So weather stations in the islands are a must for fleet operations, a key part of our bases here. Regardless of weather, though, the work must go on, planning and surveying for all the other facilities these bases need, for more airstrips, for roads and buildings and pipelines. The one thing these barren islands give us is fresh water, but getting it is another matter. Digging by hand through that frozen tundra to run a pipe back into the mountains, that's no joke. Any kind of work is tough in the damp, cold climate, but gradually, the things that go to make up a base take form. Buildings are erected to shelter men, materials, and supplies, and they're carefully dispersed against the always possible Japanese air attack. While these developments go on, engineers continually plan further ones. On this job, they have to be opportunists. Yet they must plan everything for top efficiency in using materials because of the supply problems they face. At first, on each island, all the supplies must come by barge or lighter. Then the barge acts as its own dock, while hard-working CBs sweat to unload it. This kind of logistics isn't very efficient. So one of the first major installations on a base is a pier to take deep water vessels. Even with only the simplest materials, and a little help from mechanized equipment, the job gets done in short order. With the pier completed, ships protected by the unceasing air patrol can dock and unload supplies in quantity. There's a huge amount of organization behind every load. Figure out for yourself what it takes in thought, paperwork, detail planning, handling and transport just to get one keg of nails from Chicago to the Aleutians. Then multiply that by many thousand items, large and small, and again by the hundreds or thousands of each item we need. It's quite a job. But by far the most welcome arrival is the mail. When you're far from home, in a foul climate, with little relief from the routine of your work, with few comforts and no prospect of anything different for a long, long time, well, then a letter from home is about the only thing that helps you forget where you are and what you're up against. Power tools play an increasingly important part as the work develops and the installations become more complex. With them, material can be swiftly converted into mass-produced parts. And these parts can be combined into such work savers as prefabricated trusses for a hanger. This is the kind of ingenuity and assembly line work that saves time and effort, which is plenty important when you're building as many of these hangars as we did in the Aleutians. Here, all the skills and know-how of CB brains and hands can go to work. From concrete to carpentry, plumbing to paint, wiring to roofing, to get a finished hanger in a hurry. And it doesn't take so very long with every known construction skill every one of them a crack American skill, working all at once. For the kind of men who built the Empire State Building and the Golden Gate Bridge, this kind of job presents different types of difficulties and a chance to produce new kinds of construction records. Sometimes an airstrip calls for a lot of fill. one way to get it. Meantime, the rooters and carryalls, bulldozers and tractors are ripping and tearing at that tundra. Tundra is stubborn stuff, a spongy mat of moss and other vegetation, often many feet thick. It's no fit foundation for an airstrip. Just to make it easier for the men and machines, it's usually frozen solid, so there's plenty of work to getting it out. The machines are up against another menace, too 
the fine volcanic dust that eats engine parts like emery powder, creating a colossal maintenance problem. But in spite of every difficulty, that tundra does come out. And into its place goes some of the dynamited hillside, to be leveled by our heavy artillery, the bulldozers. At the other end of the strip, the fill has been compacted and the steel mats go down. You've got to keep the work humming to build a field in 10 days or less. And to build scores of such fields, for bombers and search planes, for fighters and transports, for vital ferry stations on the way to our Russian allies. Yes, most of the planes that we lend lease to Russia, the tank-busting air Cobras and twin-engine Hudsons, came through these fields. The final touch on a field is the electricians laying out the landing lights. They're doubly useful here, where the nights are almost twice as long as they are back home. Planes and ships both mean fuel. And fuel these days means storage tanks and pipelines. The kind of bases we're building up here have to have plenty of capacity, too. Good-sized pipelines. We run them right down to a fueling pier. Now, no matter what ship comes to call, we can fill her up. Naturally, hard work breeds heavy appetites. So the cooks are among the busiest men in the base. The chow may not be very delicate, but it fills the bill and gets a hearty reception from all hands. CBs must be ready to fight as well as build. The rifle range not only keeps the eye sharp, and marksmanship up to par, but provides welcome recreation, a commodity that's never plentiful in these islands. Extensive radio installations serve recreation too, as well as vital communication needs. The whole problem of recreation is one of the worst up here, especially before a base is well established. No place to go on liberty, little to do in your spare time. That means when we finally get a place to show them that the movies, whatever the picture, are really popular with all concerned. The bowling alleys make a, a hit too. On the more serious side of morale, chaplains of all faiths, not only with formal services, but with advice and consolation, worked wonders when the going got too tough. As the work goes on all up and down the chain, island after island is turned into a working, fighting, naval and military base. First, Adak, and after we got the Japanese out, Kiska, Atu, and Agatu, and more. Coles Bay, Great Sitkin, Kodiak, until installations like these run out all along the archipelago from Dutch Harbor toward Japan. One of the last stages in completion of a base is an enlarged water supply. There's plenty of fresh water from the perpetual snows, but it must be impounded behind dams, held, and fed out as needed. Far up in the mountains, then, men must go to work to excavate the frozen ground and pour concrete in zero cold, to dam the valleys and gullies to provide an unfailing water supply. When the dam is finished, it's no grand coulee, but it will hold the thousands upon thousands of gallons of water we need to supply the base and to replenish the ships that come to the harbor. Clear and fresh, naturally purified and filtered as it runs, it comes down to us already iced. Meantime, in the Pacific to the south, our forces have rolled back the enemy. One deep stab into his empire ran up through the Marianas, Iwo, and Okinawa. Another slashed in through the Philippines. After the blow from the west, from Russia, the Aleutians provided the potential fourth member of a gigantic pincer, 
And with Japan's fall, they became our main bastion in the north. But even as that empire folded under our blows, the other war and the Aleutians went on. The eternal subarctic war between men and elements. Storms come fast in this country, violent and strong, opposing all but insurmountable obstacles to human and mechanical strength. Eventually, all other work must stop until the snow is cleared away. The only way to get that done is with carry-alls, bulldozers, and plows. Mechanical snow shovels that multiply the strength of man a thousand times. These ingenious machines may have been designed for clearing highways, but they work just as well on an Aleutian airstrip. Between CBs and engineers, with plenty of work, the job gets done. Again, the brain and brawn of man have temporarily licked the tricks and cruelty of nature, and our bases can operate once more. Under the midnight sun, flying patrols, transporting supplies, fighting, the planes take off and land. Not only are the Aleutians now secure and safe, but we have, in these islands, a permanent operating base, a way station on the shortest route to our ally, Russia, and a northern highway to Tokyo. A mighty force to keep the peace. summer at the bottom of the world. 